Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Thursday, December 13th. Some city council members want to put the $100 million workman's compensation program in new hands. We hear from the alderman leading the charge. Touchdown confirmed. From amazing new vistas of Mars to a little rover bouncing on a distant asteroid, an exploration of recent human achievements in outer space. Meet the Chicago artists whose caricatures of famous people in popular culture go around the world. So we're going to learn a lot of new things today here. Christopher Kimball on his new cookbook for quick weeknight dinners. A restaurant critic who's relatively new in town serves up a sizzling takedown of Chicago's food scene. And in tonight's viewer feedback, your thoughts about the controversial fishing technique called snagging. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. Big breaking news in the world of Chicago politics. Amanda Vinicky has that story and more. Of what's making news in Chicago tonight? Amanda. Phil, that news this evening is about the federal investigation into Alderman Ed Burke. Carol Marine and NBC5 are reporting Burke's Finance Committee office at City Hall was raided again today. That's the second time his properties have been searched. No one at the U.S. Attorney's Office answered calls for more details. Cook County's acting public guardian is suing the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services on behalf of children in the state's custody who were warehoused in psychiatric hospitals. The suit alleges DCFS routinely forces children to be locked in psych wards past the point of medical necessity. Skyler, who didn't want her last name shared for privacy reasons, is 19 now. In 2015, she says she waited to be discharged for months after she'd been cleared for release. I was there for six months. I spent Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, Easter, and my 16th birthday in the hospital. Um, I only got to go outside one time. Um, I felt like a prisoner. I felt very depressed. Attorneys say budget cuts are at fault, that the agency has consistently reduced spending on residential treatment, such that there wasn't anywhere for children to go after their hospital stays. The suit says it's the responsibility of DCFS to place its wards in appropriate settings. Illinois' governor-elect skewered him on the campaign trail, but today, Democrat J.B. Pritzker visited with President Donald Trump and apparently his daughter Ivanka at the White House. Pritzker introduced himself as having founded Business Incubator 1871, among other credentials. And as I've been speaking with your daughter, I've also been a national advocate for early childhood education. Trump had invited the nation's newly elected governors to that meeting. Uh, all of them had great victories. Some had very, very uh, outstanding victories in terms of the percentage of victory and even surprising. We have uh, some real stars in the room. The president went on to say winning is a wonderful thing. Pritzker says he used his time in Washington to advocate for federal money for infrastructure. He says Trump's criticism of Chicago and its sanctuary status for immigrants did not come up. The long vacant old post office will get another new tenant, Ferrara Candies, moving its headquarters downtown from Oak Brook Terrace. The company, known for candies including Lemonheads and Redheads, as well as brands like Sweet Tarts, Nerds, and Butterfinger, has a long sweet history in Chicago. The confectioner was founded in Chicago's Little Italy in 1908. Some 400 employees will relocate this summer. As for the weather, cold now, patchy fog and rain tonight with a low around 37, then early morning fog and a chance of rain tomorrow morning before becoming mostly cloudy with a high near 41 degrees. And don't forget, you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com news. You can also watch via podcast and the PBS video app. And after the break, Phil Ponce and the Alderman going after a source of Alderman Ed Burke's power. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight podcast 
and subscribe. As we just heard, Carol Marine and NBC5 are reporting that the offices, the City Hall offices, that is, of Alderman Ed Burke have been raided yet again. Many believe he is the most powerful person in Chicago City Council. 14th Ward Alderman Ed Burke has been in office nearly 50 years. A major part of his power stems from his finance committee that oversees Chicago's $100 million work workers' compensation program. Accusations of mismanagement of that program have circulated for years. Now those accusations have led to efforts to pull that power away from Burke and the City Council altogether. And joining us is one of the members of the City Council's Progressive Caucus, a group that's pushing for that change. 45th Ward Alderman John Arena, he is sponsoring the ordinance to move the workers' compensation program into new hands. And uh, Alderman Arena, thank you for joining us tonight. First of all, your quick reaction to news that uh, the uh, Alderman Burke's office had been raided again. Well, it was a, a surprise, you know, the first time. Um, you know, obviously, we don't know what, uh, you know, what's motivating the investigation. So I think it's it's premature to kind of speculate on that. And uh, you know, this is something that uh, has to be worked through through the legal system. And you know, we we trust that that will happen in a fair and equitable way. Let's move to the workers' comp uh, program and uh, just give me a real quick. Uh, the thumbnail sketch of how does it work right now? It, say so, I'm a worker and I'm injured on the job, what happens? So uh, you make an application to the program itself, uh, which is administered uh, within the finance committee structure. So uh, it, it would be the same as if it, if it were under a, a different authority, say under the, uh, in the administration as we're proposing. Uh, from a worker standpoint, it's basically you apply, there's an evaluation process of your of how you were injured, how, making sure that it was on the job, and then you know benefits are then uh, paid out. What we don't know is what is that evaluation process. Once the application goes in, um, what we're trying to achieve is just some transparency uh, to that process of how it's determined uh, what benefits should be paid out and for how long. The, the reason why we're doing what we're doing is because the, the inspector general has no audit power of city council committees. So basically, just state exactly what it is, that uh, you, how you want the system to change. So the only thing we want to do is take the program in its entirety and move it from out from underneath the finance committee, and which is atypical in government structures in, in, today's, uh, in today's world, uh, and move it underneath the law department, which is more standard uh, we've looked around Illinois, no other municipality in Illinois has their workman's compensation program underneath a legislative committee. It is always in either the law department or HR or some, some oversight of both. And expand on, on uh, the consequences of moving the uh, work, workers' compensation program from under a legislative committee, in this case the finance committee, uh, to the executive branch uh, that is the uh, corporation counsel's office. Exactly. So, so, so what, what happens then? So, so what happens then is then, because this, the inspector general, Joe Ferguson, and when the city council adopted uh, his oversight of, of our actions. So he can investigate me as an alderman and what I do, but, he, but if I had a committee, he could not investigate the actions and, and spending of that committee, which means he can't tell us if there's better ways to do things. He can't do performance audits of how we manage our committee. And in this case, this is a $100 million program, and uh, we have no way of knowing uh, if benefits are applied equally across the board, we don't know if they're over applied or under applied. There, there, there There's simply no way to know. question whether or not some of those benefits are distributed on the basis of patronage and that sort of thing. Yeah, in 2012, the inspector general did a, did an analysis uh, based on kind of what he could see from the outside, who had gotten the benefits, how long, and then he made a correlation in his report uh, that that some of those workers, you know, were doing patronage work for uh, for political figures. Um, in 2016, when we adopted the uh, the oversight of the IG, our ordinance, the the Progressive uh, Caucus's ordinance, the original ordinance uh, that Michelle Smith and of the 43rd Ward worked very diligently on, allowed for that auditing power to go down to into the committees. Because at a my last understanding is that there, even though it's a hundred million dollar program, it has never been audited. Uh, there is an there is an audit, uh, a kind of an accounting audit. So. 
The way I, I, I explain this is uh, the accounting audit tells us that two plus two equals four. The problem is it doesn't tell us how did you get two and two in the first place. And so we really need that uh, oversight. Uh, this is a program that, you know, by other measures, it's very large. Other municipalities uh, do not pay out quite that much. Some, uh, some have said $20 million, $30 million is more uh, reasonable for a city our size. So what, this is what we need to know. If, uh, if every dollar of that $100 million is, is applied appropriately, great, let's know it. If not, then let's look at ways that we can be more efficient with that, th those dollars, especially at a time when the mayor just announced uh, that we have a pension crisis. Um, we're gonna, he, his proposal is to ask pensioners to take COLA reductions. If we have $100 million sitting there that we can't see, it's basically a black box, we cannot go out and say we've done everything we can to use the money we have access to wisely if we can't see into this program. Do you have an issue with Alderman Burke personally as far as his running the program? No, I mean, I respect Alderman Burke, his tenure, uh, uh, you know, his, his experience on, as, as a, a council member. Um, this is and has been all about uh, transparency and accountability. And my tenure on the council for the last eight years has, has definitely included that as what has been driving me and what my constituents have asked over and over again, saying, look, we'll pay our taxes. We want government services. Let's make sure we do it efficiently. Let's find ways to deliver good or better service with less money. If this amount of this program of this size were, were anywhere else, we would still have the same problem with it. If it were under a different alderman's committee, we would be doing the same thing. Now, well, obviously, you know that there's a mayor's uh, race uh, in the works right now going to be new members of the city council before too long. Yeah. Why not wait and let them handle it? Why do something like this at this moment? Well, the I, I've been asked that question. 2012 is when, you know, that's six years ago. How long do we wait for good government? And I think there is no time like right now to continue to press for a, a more transparent and open government in Chicago. And let's start the next council with new members and a new mayor on a, on a better foot and put and, and, and have this put to rest as we start a new council and move forward in, in terms of dealing with the, the issues that we have to deal with, like pension reform. Some uh, folks are calling this a political move on your part and on the part of the Progressive Caucus, especially in light of uh, the, the, uh, the earlier raids on Alderman Burke's uh, City Hall office and his aldermanic office, and now today's raid. Uh, is it political on your part? No, it's, it's transparency and accountability. That has been my political motivation to get into, into politics in Chicago, to come into government and try to reform. Um, I think, you know, my record on this is, is pretty clear. Again, we worked on this in 2016. We were blocked from getting this kind of insight into the, into the program, you know, by Ed Burke and, and some other of his allies. That's, that's fine. He made that move, maneuver, was able to gain the votes. We're back now trying to get where we need to be as a, as a government in Chicago. Uh, one, of the things that, uh, one of the things that comes up is uh, how many members are there in the Progressive Caucus? Eleven. Okay, eleven. So all eleven are in favor of this proposal. Um, yeah. I mean, we, we had ten sign on. Uh, some wanted to think about it. We brought it to the floor uh, Wednesday. Um, but, yeah, we, I think we have, uh, I think as we kind of talk more about this, the reasons why we need to do it, I think that's pretty well known. I think we'll be able to garner the support to, to move it. It's been relegated to rules, so that was a maneuver again to slow this down and block it. We've seen that happen before in a number of uh, progressive initiatives, uh, like the Back to Basics TIF ordinance and other things that the Progressive Caucus has moved on. It, it, for me, it's constant pressure on uh, bringing good government to Chicago. You don't do these things in, in big leaps and get everything right in one, in one you know, go about it. You keep pressure on, you keep moving the ball and in incremental change to, uh, to making things better for taxpayers. John Arena, thank you so much for joining us. Very much Thanks appreciated. For me on. And there's more Chicago tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part through the generous support of the Julius Frankel Foundation.
Still to come on Chicago tonight, historical figures and contemporary politicians, plus pop culture icons captured in caricature by a Chicago artist. Chef, author, television and radio host Christopher Kimball talks about his latest cookbook for quick and easy weeknight recipes. The writer of an article criticizing Chicago's restaurant and dining scene makes his case. And in viewer feedback, your thoughts about snagging salmon in Chicago. Is it ethical fishing or cruelty to animals? But first, Eddie Aruza and an exploration of some of the latest stories from outer space. Eddie. It's been quite a month of major achievements in space exploration, mostly coming from NASA, which has reached some new milestones. And even more are expected in the weeks ahead. Late last month, the latest probe sent to Mars landed flawlessly and so far appears to be performing as planned. That was followed by the arrival at an asteroid of the first American spacecraft designed to collect samples from its surface and return them back to Earth. And in a little over two weeks, on New Year's Day as a matter of fact, the New Horizons spacecraft, which made history when it flew by Pluto three years ago, is set to fly by the farthest object ever to be explored by humans. And with us tonight to explore these cosmic stories and some others is Adler Planetarium astronomer Lucianne Walkowitz. And Lucianne, welcome back to Thank Chicago you. tonight. And uh, before we go exploring outer space, I need to say that you haven't visited us for over a year because you were out on an adventure in our nation's capital. Ta tell us a little bit about that. That I was. Um, I was spending the year doing research at the Library of Congress. They have this position called the Bloomberg Chair in Astrobiology. It's a year-long position to go and do research at the Library of Congress with their collections. And what did you research? Well, I was there researching the ethics of humans going into space. So as we talk about going beyond the orbit of the moon and out to Mars, what are the ethical considerations and what can we learn from the history of exploration on Earth that we might bring to make interplanetary exploration even better. And I know that's been a subject of interest for you for a long time, and we're going to get into that a little later in our conversation, but good for you. I also have a photograph of something else that you did, because I know you did a lot of reach out and you did a lot of um, speaking and, and, and lectures, but here we have some kids from D.C. that came to hear you talk. Yeah, absolutely. One of the wonderful things about this opportunity was the chance to talk with the public about some of the research that I was doing. So I got to convene meetings and of course talk with school groups. Uh, this group of students is in our Young Reader Center at the Library of Congress and we're talking about what it would take to build communities on Mars. Wow, well that, <laughs> that must have been a fascinating conversation there. It, it and was. Let's, let's <laughs> speak a little bit about uh, Mars and uh, your, your the, the planet that you have such a passion for and the, the InSight landing there just a couple of weeks ago and we went to the Adler to uh, witness that landing with uh, your colleague Mark Hammergren. But what is the importance of this particular uh, probe on Mars? You know, the thing that InSight will let us see, which we've never really been able to before, is a little bit about what lies at the heart of Mars. You know, right now we've had, for decades, rovers on its surface and spacecraft that orbit, study its atmosphere, its magnetic field, but we don't really know what the interior of Mars is like. So InSight will actually be able to tell us about heat in the interior of the planet. It'll be able to sense any quakes that might be there. And of course, earthquakes here on Earth are really important for us to be able to trace what the interior of our own planet is. So it's kind of a way of figuring out Mars uh, from the inside out instead of from the outside in. And it's still going to take a couple months for the, the, the spacecraft to actually get fully functional, uh, but it is already sending back photographs. These are really cool. Is this a better camera than any of the others that they've sent up there? Because they're so detailed. You know, one of the things that I think is so compelling about Mars and why it uh, holds such an important place in human imagination is that we do have these wonderful vistas, not just from InSight, but from the Curiosity rover, for example. We can really uh, picture ourselves on the surface. And as if landing on Mars wasn't enough, the, uh, the, this other spacecraft that was sent to this asteroid called Bennu arrived, and it's going to be um, orbiting this, this little asteroid for a while. And the importance of this asteroid is that it could be on a collision course with Earth. Tell us about that. Well, so the spacecraft, OSIRIS-REx, is a mission that is going to study this uh, little rock. It's uh, you know, just about as big as a very tall skyscraper. 
and it uh, is one of these pristine bodies in the solar system that we think is leftover rubble from the early formation of the solar system. So one of the very cool things that this mission will do will be to eventually send back a little sample of what that asteroid is made up of. And we're seeing the animation now that NASA has created to, to give us an idea of how that will work. That's exactly right, and so we'll be able to study this pristine material from the very, very early days of the solar system. Um, so this helps us understand where our solar system came from, how it formed, and the building blocks that may have one day led to planets that have life, like even like Earth. And again, this is animation, but this is an actual photograph of that, that asteroid. And it has a 1 in 2,700 uh, chance of hitting the Earth sometime in late next century. But what, uh, from this visit to the asteroid and whatever it brings back, might tell us of whether it might collide with Earth and how to prevent something like that from happening? Well, what this visit will tell us is a little bit more about how the asteroid is structured, what it's made up of. Um, you know, one of the things that has been debated when we talk about trying to, you know, maybe deflect an asteroid that might hit us is that it's hard to understand how to design a mission that might do something like that if you don't know whether something is soft or crumbly or hard or brittle. Or whether we can blow it up, I guess, <laughs> is the question, right? Right. Um, so this, though, is really about finding out about the very origin of our solar system. Um, generally speaking, we track the near-Earth asteroids like Bennu and map their orbits very, very carefully. That's work that, that is done um, by you know, some of my colleagues at the Adler. And that is really what helps us understand whether they might strike us or not. But we're not the first to reach an asteroid this year. The Japanese spacecraft called Hayabusa 2 got to uh, the other uh, asteroid, which is called, what is that called? Uh, I'll get the name in a second. <laughs> okay. I have it here. But in any case, I forget. They <laughs> well, I, I forget too. But they landed actually three little uh, probes and a micro rover on that asteroid. And they will also be bringing back samples from that. Uh, that tiny body. That's exactly right. I really love the rovers that Hayabusa 2 has because um, we think about rovers as being something that roll around the surface. And these are little tiny rovers that hop um, because the gravity of these bodies, because uh, they're small, is so low that you can just have a little hopping rover. And they actually sent back some really cool photos also hopping uh, on, on, on this um, uh, asteroid. New Horizons made history, it's hard to believe, already three and a half years ago when it flew by Pluto, but now it's on its way to this, this what's called a Kuiper Belt object, a KBO. Um, and it's, it's t so tiny that it wasn't discovered until just a few years ago. But tell us about the importance of reaching this farthest ever object uh, to be explored. Well, so this new object, Ultima Thule, is the furthest thing that we will have ever explored in the solar system. Um, you know, Pluto, we learned so much about Pluto from the New Horizons mission when it originally made its flyby. And prior to that, Pluto was just this sort of mushy pea looking thing. Even from Hubble Space Telescope pictures, it really didn't have a lot of detail. And now we have all of this amazing detail. So one of the things that we're really looking forward to learning about is what are these outer bodies like, these Kuiper Belt objects like Ultima Thule that we will be investigating with New Horizons. So that'll be very exciting on January 1st, I guess, when we're all waking up and maybe sobering up for some of us. <laughs> we'll get the, the first uh, data from, from that object. I want to ask you about this strange object that came into our solar system last year, and it was discovered as it was flying out. It's called Oumuamua, and you know, immediately nobody knew what it was, and, they, and uh, scientists such as yourself discovered that it was an interstellar object. It was the first one to ever be detected that came from some other part of our galaxy. But now there's even talk. It's still a sensation because some think that it might have been sent by aliens. <laughs> what, what do you think? Um, well, I think it's a fascinating object. I, it does appear to be interstellar, so uh, we figured that out by looking at its orbit. It has this kind of plunging orbit where it's come into the solar system and uh, is on its way back out, presumably. Um, but it is also very curious because it has this strange shape. So it's very elongated and skinny, so almost like um, either a pill or a long cigar or something like that. 
And one of the things that has been particularly interesting about it is that even though it comes into the solar system and uh, get rather close to the sun, you know, usually you would expect to see, um, like with comets, uh, a little bit of evaporation, some gas and dust coming off of this object. Um, now that wasn't the case, but we also saw that it seemed to speed up a little bit. Um, and so that has led some people to suggest, well, maybe this is uh, something called a light sail. So there are these programs like Breakthrough Starshot that want to send very, very thin films, um, like a big sheet, to other worlds. And so, you know, it's not tremendously far-fetched to think that another, you know, technological civilization out there might do something like that. But I would say that's a pretty outside chance <laughs> <laughs> so for, for right what now, this is. So now, we have to go with that. It's, it's a, a natural object that somehow came into our solar system yeah, and it's, made its way around. It's probably a natural object, but it's still very cool. Um, and, you know, our first interstellar visitor, whether it's a rock or not. <laughs> and speaking of stars, you've kind of become one in your own right uh, during <laughs> these, this past year because you're taking part in this rather odd hybrid show on the Nat Geo channel called Mars, and it's partly scripted fiction and then partly uh, experts such as yourself talking about issues on Mars. And I want to play just a little clip of, of that so we get a sense of what it's all about. Some form of territorial law has to be put in place. Might I suggest that we're being overly cautious here? No one owns the planet. Even our existing legislation around Mars leaves a lot of areas open to interpretation. Back in 1967, the entire world agreed on this outer space treaty that essentially states that no one can own another planet. Drill, drill. We well, need the oil. Well, Why are we even discussing this? So we when we talk about what we're thinking about doing on Mars, what we're really doing is talking about what we think is okay to do here on this planet. So it contains documentary features and it contains the scripted drama. Tell me a little bit about the, the approach here and what uh, the, the creators had in mind. Well, I think that they really wanted the best of both worlds. Uh, so this docudrama format brings you these very rich characters. Um, this is the second season of the show, and so they're now on Mars, and the scientific base has been joined by a company that wants to mine. So one of the things that I really like about the show is that it shows the human side of going to Mars and the conflicts that might arise, the collaborations or cooperations, um, and also ties it back to stuff that's happening here on Earth. So I think it's really very compelling watching. Well, Lucienne Walkowitz, it's great to have you back in Chicago. Great and to we'll be, be back. tapping into your expertise <laughs> more often now that you're back in town. Thanks so much. Thank you. And there's more Chicago tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. Coverage of science and technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, President of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. For more than 25 years, a Chicago artist has made thousands of ink drawings and caricatures for the New Yorker magazine. Tom Bachtel has also created distinctive artwork for the Chicago Tribune, Poetry Magazine, and our sister station, 98.7 WFMT. A rare gallery show of his work just opened, and we spoke to the artist on the eve of the opening. There is Barack Obama, Chicago-born choreographer Bob Fosse, the Fab Four, and Jacqueline Kennedy rendered with an economy of line and color, plus a host of other historic and contemporary figures from popular culture and politics. From his busy art studio in the Loop, Tom Bactell makes images that resonate far beyond Chicago. I really consider that when I'm drawing people, it's, it's really a process of just getting to know them. I do a lot of study and I do a lot of, look at a lot of pictures and I read about them and, and, uh, and that's an ongoing process. So every time I, I come to them, I know them a little bit better. I love doing everybody. Uh, because I, I'm interested, I think, in, in everybody in so many different things. So I would hate it if I just had to draw politicians. I love artists and I find them very really interesting to draw. And actually that that's, was, has been one of the wonderful things about working with The New Yorker is that I get the, the chance to, uh, to draw artists and musicians. Bechtel has drawn Beethoven in a taxi cab for WFMT and he did the cover art for a musical salute to Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg for the local label, Say D Records. 
The artist currently has a show at Adventureland, the gallery owned by Chicago artist and actor Tony Fitzpatrick. Longtime subscribers to The New Yorker, the Fitzpatricks are big fans of Tom Bactell. What I loved about his drawings is every drawing is a different kind of experiment. There is the restless spirit of improvisation in how he draws, and it's exciting. It's not just caricatures or, or celebrities or any of that. It's actually telling a story of um, you know American history and uh, our culture and and how we build ourselves as a as a country. It's such a weird, odd combination of uh, folks too. It's not just um, it's not just politics. It's not just uh, pop culture celebrities. It's just all of it wrapped into one that makes what our country is like fueled on. Seen here in a self-portrait, Bechtel grew up in Ohio. And if you detected a musicality to his drawings, that might be because he's also a conservatory trained pianist and he teaches swing dance. A self-taught artist, Bechtel has an uncommon eye for his subjects. You know, I, I come at people from a lot of different angles. I'm very interested in movement, uh, I'm very interested in rhythm. And so I don't think that I, when I'm looking at you, for example, I'm, I'm not sort of thinking, well, you know, your eyes are here. Well, maybe a little bit, but, but, but I'm also trying to take you in. Just sort of the feel of somebody, their carriage, how they, how they hold themselves, how they hold their heads. A lot of that is, is, is subconscious, and, but, I, but I'm taking it in, and then later I process it, and, and I, I combine that with sort of my knowledge of their features and, and try to to make a, ultimately make a drawing that lives. Bechtel draws by hand with markers, brush and ink, and only uses computers or tablets to add a splash of color. I can make mistakes when I'm, when I'm working with just a brush and ink, and uh, the tablets tend to kind of perfect things and make things look nice, and, and I'd rather be able to have mistakes and, and try to incorporate them. He often has just a day or two to complete an assignment, and he frequently revisits the same subjects in his drawings. Sometimes people get easier and then they get harder. <laughs> and often there's a certain internal logic to, to the drawing, so that if I get the parts of it right, you know, uh, then then the, then the drawings sort of fall into place. What I try to avoid is trying to be very, you know, be very careful and sort of replicate, this image has to go here, or this feature has to go here, this feature has to go here. Uh, it's more of a sort of a larger uh, architectural scheme. Tom Bachtel's work will be at Adventureland Gallery through December 29th. You can see more of his work, including his characters of Mayor Rahm Emanuel, Lou Reed, and others on our website. And now to Brandis Friedman and a new cookbook for quick and tasty weeknight dinners. Brandis. Our next guest is a pretty familiar face to PBS audiences. Mm. Even after many, many years in the kitchen, I still feel like a beginner, and that's why I love to cook. Christopher Kimball, you know, the guy with the bow tie, is the founder of Milk Street Media and host of Milk Street Television, seen here on WTTW. He hosts a public radio show, Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Radio, and when he's not doing that, he produces a bi-monthly magazine. And he's got a new cookbook. Christopher Kimball joins us tonight to talk about his latest Milk Street Tuesday Nights. Welcome back to Chicago Tonight. My pleasure. Always love being here. Let's start with the title. Why Tuesday Nights? I don't care about the other nights. <laughs> <laughs> Tuesday Nights are the only ones to eat. Well, it's, it's the night you're least prepared and you have nothing to cook. There are no leftovers from the weekend. So you have half an hour, 45 minutes to put dinner on the table, supper on the table. And so the concept of the book is how do you do that but end up with big flavors? And the answer is... We travel around the world, we cook with different people, we figure out how they cook, uh, learn those lessons, bring them back, and it, most of the world has a better idea about how to get food on the table quickly and better food than we do, it turns out. Uh, and those lessons are in the book, Tuesday night. Why aren't Americans as fast to get food on the table as some of those other countries? Uh, well, if, if you think traditionally about Fanny Farmer and where our food came from, was you know, it comes from all over the world, but Northern Europe was the original place it came from. And, and that's about time, it's about technique, it's about heat. Uh, if you look at the rest of the world, they start with big flavors, handfuls of herbs, 
bags of chilies, uh, 80 or 90 spices, you know, in Istanbul. Uh, fermented sauces like soy sauce, uh, galangal, ginger, you know, scallions, etc. So if you start with spices, if you start with chilies, you start with handfuls of herbs. There's a recipe I just looked at in from Iran where they have a, some beans, they cook them, and they had five cups of herbs. You know, not five tablespoons, five cups of herbs and continue cooking it. So when you do that, you, you, you're beginning with big flavors, and so to get to big flavors is easy. If you start with kind of bland, you know, basic root vegetables and meat, sort of bland foods, then it takes more time and energy to get to big flavor. So you've organized recipes in Tuesday nights by fast, faster, fastest. Obviously, an important part of cooking now, speed, timeliness. Yeah, we're very smart. We, we, <laughs> we organize <laughs> it too fast. Yeah, I mean, it's like 45 minutes, half an hour, under half an hour. Uh, and and I, I just have to say, you know, speed isn't everything in cooking. There are times when you put something in the oven like a braise and come back in two hours. But, you know, on Tuesday night, you have to do it fairly quickly. So we just want to divide it into those categories. A lot of people think, well, okay, I'll take half an hour, but if it's 40 minutes, you know, I'm not going to do this. So then what is the longest time frame uh, for an hour? But I think 45 minutes is sort of our, our fast, and then you get to 30 minutes, and then fastest is probably 20 minutes, 25 minutes. So while the mills themselves are fast, what does a home chef need to know or do or have uh, to be able to get dinner on the table within the recommended advised time frame? We, we, we do use probably more spices than like my mother had, which were three or four spices from the late Truman administration that she kept around in her pantry, you know. Uh, so there's a few things you'd probably want to have. Uh, you know, you probably a little soy sauce would be good, a little fish sauce. So it isn't like a lot of odd ingredients. We don't have gochujang. Korean sauce, you know, in every recipe. But it's the way you use them. So for example, there's a great technique where you take a little oil, take some spice, whatever it is, infuse it into the oil, warm it up for a couple minutes, drizzle that on the dish uh, when you're done. And that works on almost anything. So there's little tricks. The other thing is, is flavor combinations. You know, most of the world uses bitter or charred or sweet. But we don't usually combine those in our cooking. In our cooking, everything sort of tastes the same, like chicken soup here, you know, is the noodles taste like chicken, the chicken tastes like chicken, the carrots taste like chicken. If you go to Somalia, they have hot sauces, they'll use some fresh cabbage or radish on the top. Other places in the world will jazz it up different ways. So there's, there are different layers and you have, you have bright big flavors. And so it's not a question of really technique, just a question of using the right ingredients and putting them together in the right way. And that's, that was our job is to figure that part out. So then there is a bit of prep in the grocery store, for example, to be sure that you have some of these items in the house. Do I need to go to special grocery stores? No, uh, and I would say 85% of the recipes in the book, you, know, you can find everything in the supermarket, and you probably have most of them. But, but, but it's good to have a few extra things there because that just transforms your cooking. You know, if you think about the pantries other people use in the world, that they, instead of just black pepper, they might have another kind of pepper. Or they have whole, whole seeds like cumin or coriander. If you have a whole seed instead of ground, you can toast it in a skillet in a couple of minutes and grind it up or, or use it whole and it has a lot more flavor. So there's a, a few little tricks like that. Um, we've got two of the faster recipes on our website. They're paprika rubbed pork tenderloin, tenderloin and orichetti with sausage. Um, do you recommend sticking to the recipes or are they sort of a jumping off point? Can I get creative if I wanted to? I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> well, I have for 40 years said, don't mess with a recipe. So I think the first time you do it, sure, follow the recipe. But I think the point here is that you get a little bit liberated at one point, and you go like, that, that first thing you mentioned, the tenderloin, it's pinchos moranos from Spain. It's a tapas. All it is is a pork tenderloin, and you have a spice rub with some salt, uh, and you put it on the pork and let it sit a few minutes, and then saute it in a pan. It takes 15 minutes total. The idea of, of, of a spice rub with salt on meat, let it sit, and then quickly cook it, well, you can do that with almost anything. So th there are some lessons here you can take away. So there are also, a lot of people subscribe to the sort of pre-prepared meal delivery services, like Plated or Blue Apron. What do you think the rise of those, and we were talking about the Instant Pot as well, what does that uh, say about how we're cooking and eating these days? I love it when people say, you know, I hear all the time, well, people aren't cooking anymore. And then I walk into the grocery store, well, there are all those produce. I mean, someone's buying the stuff. I mean, there, you can buy broccoli still, you know, so somebody's buying raw ingredients. You can buy chicken, you can buy beef. Uh, and so there's a lot of cooking going on. I think the thing about America is so great, over 300 million people, yeah, they're the people who are going to do the, the meal kits. And that's fine. And then there, some people might do the meal kits and go like, well, maybe I'll do it on my own tonight, you know. Or there are people who go out to dinner every night, like if they live 
in the Upper East Side of New York, probably they don't do a lot of cooking. So th there's so much diversity in terms of how people cook. There's a lot of cooking going on. And I would say um, among 20 year olds and 30 year olds, I can't believe I said that because it makes me feel old <laughs> because I thought I, w I would never look back that far. But uh, there's this a real interest in cooking and the reason is cooking is something they didn't experience many of them in their families growing up and now it's something they really take to. So I see a lot of really serious cooking going on with people half my age. Uh, and so I don't, you know, it's all anything that gets someone interested in the kitchen, even if it's a meal kit, you have to get in the kitchen anyway. That's fine, you know, it, because eventually some of those people will decide, hey, you know, cooking's not a chore. I kind of like this, you know. It's, maybe I, I would enjoy it, actually, which is not what you heard back in the 70s and 80s, you know, cooking's drudgery. Uh, and back in the 1880s and 90s, w women didn't want to cook because they spent six or seven hours a day doing it and it was 40 percent of your of your annual budget is very expensive so it turns out that people want a convenience which made sense but now we're at the point where you can cook fairly quickly you don't have to spend 40 percent of your income on food uh, and I think it's a for a lot of people it's a pleasure uh, you spent a section on the instant pot as well why is that so popular are you surprised by it um, well, look, it's basically a pressure cooker, I mean, more or less, and, and it's great. The, the only problem is I have one, I bought one a couple years ago. You know, I used it twice, uh, and it is in fact in my basement. Uh, it's where I can find it, but I mean, it's like anything else. It, it's a tool if, if you incorporate it in your cooking. For example, I was just in Oaxaca, Mexico, and I was in some home kitchens, they all have pressure cookers. And the reason is, all the pork and other meat they cook, they cook in a pressure cooker quickly, then they use it in tacos and other recipes. So sure, if it's part of your repertoire, you use it, great. But if it's one of those things, you know, you, you made ribs with it once. And then, you know, the, the older I get, the more experience I have, I tend to have a simpler kitchen now. So for me, probably not. But for if, if you really use it, sure, there's nothing wrong with it. And we'll have to leave it on the instant pot. Christopher Kimball, thank you again for joining us My on pleasure. Chicago Tonight. Again, the newest cookbook, Milk Street Tuesday Nights and Milk Street Television airs here on Channel 11 on Saturday afternoons. And Chicago Tonight continues in a moment, so stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Allstate. Allstate is investing in Chicago's youth. We believe good starts young. That's why we're helping our youth develop the skills they need to achieve success in life. Allstate is proud to empower the next generation of leaders. Chicago's food scene is a far cry from its former glory. That's according to critic John Kessler, whose recent Chicago Magazine article lists five flaws he sees in the city's restaurant and dining culture. The piece has generated some backlash, but Kessler says he's also received some off-the-record accolades. Joining us to make his case that Chicago's food scene has lost its luster is John Kessler, contributing dining critic to Chicago Magazine. John Kessler, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Okay, so this article has been out a couple days. What kind of, uh, what are you hearing from people? Have you gotten any feedback? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe just a little tiny bit, but um, no, it's been it's been pretty overwhelming. I now know what it's like to spend all day on Twitter, and I don't want to do it again. But um, it's been great. I've gotten you know a lot of people who saying that who are saying that you know I kind of took the words out of their mouth, and a lot of people saying you're wrong across the board. I can't believe you said that. Go back to where you came from. <laughs> and you came from Atlanta, where yes. you were a food critic there for uh, how many years? Uh, Eighteen. And you've been here for three years. Yeah, you've been here for three years. Okay, well, let's. Uh, you list five things that you think are, uh, are are issues with Chicago's food scene, and let's uh, let's look at the first one. Okay. The first one is that the, the food scene lacks local produce and seasonal cooking. Uh, and you say cooks here don't trust seasonal produce to carry a dish. Uh, expand on that. So that was something that I thought about for a long time after I moved here because it was bumming me out. I feel like here so much of farm to table cooking is relegated to the high end restaurants and looked at as kind of a fad elsewhere. Um, I think what happened when you hear about California cooking and what's happened in California, you know, the same thing has happened in Texas and in the southeast where I came from in New England and the whole farm to table movement wasn't just a fad, it was transformative and it changed the way chefs think about their menus and plan them and buy, purchase, preserve. Um, you know, I, in Atlanta before 
all the really good stuff comes in in summer. Everyone has kale flowers all over their salads because that's what's in season then. Well, uh, speaking of in season, I mean, keep, you know, some people might say, well, you know, the window here for fresh produce, given that it's the Midwest and winters occupy a big portion of the year, the window is smaller. And one of the things you say, you point out specifically, is that sweet corn is not made a deal here, and that surprises you. I know. I mean, you think about the sweet corn in the southeast or New Jersey Silver Queen. I mean, you know the varieties, and you celebrate it when it comes in. And I think, you know, if you go to Vermont or you go to Copenhagen, I mean, you know, Rene Redzepi, at, in, a chef in Copenhagen, has really proven that you can take a seasonal approach anywhere you are. So I just don't buy it. I think, I wish, you know, it was just more in bars and neighborhood restaurants. Not just the high end stuff. Okay, let's go to the second right, one. And you say moving that, on. Uh, moving on to number two, you say that the uh, food scene needs exciting immigrant food. And a lot of people might say, what? <laughs> Chicago is vastly diverse. There are ethnic restaurants all over the place. What's your point? So this is the one I've gotten the most flack for. And to me, what I'm saying is there's some things we can't change. You know, Chicago is an incredibly segregated place. And I think that there are places that you tend to associate with immigrant cooking, like Chinatown or Greek Town, which is sort of a tourist trap now, I guess. But um, what happens in warm weather cities is you get a lot more recent immigration. There are all these, you know, just strip malls pretty close to the downtown and people, the diners and the chefs alike, are really changing the way they eat. They have so many options for, you know, food from, you know, Vietnam, Korea, all the different regions of China. And it You don't just, think that exists here. I mean, I can think of several Thai restaurants that uh, feature different cuisines from Thailand. That's true. Thai restaurant, actually Thai food is really great here. And um, I am with you. I love um, sticky rice on Western, which has a lot of that Northern Isan Thai style food and some others. But the thing is, is you don't have that profusion of choice. And you know, there are some really interesting things in the suburbs, but they're also so far. And I don't know how much people actually get those flavors, you know, into their bones, into the way they cook and think and eat. All right, well, let's get to the third one. Okay. You, uh, you argue that there are too many restaurant groups in the West Loop and just generally. What's the problem with groups uh, like Let Us Entertain You and so forth? Having a collection of restaurants that can range, uh, have the range, have a spectrum of different uh, cuisines. Well, as I brought up in the article, I think one problem is bulk purchasing. You tend to start seeing a lot of menus looking like other menus. But the thing is, they're not doing themselves any favors. There's so many talented people working for these restaurant groups. But you look at, you know, the West Loop used to be very edgy. You had places like the Publican, Girl and the Goat, um, Moto, that were really, you know, edgy and changing the way Chicago thought about food and what was working here. But now, it's so expensive, it's so prohibitively expensive that they've got to kind of take a, you know, a safe bet. They've got to fill seats. They've got to get a lot of people in seats in these big places that are starting to seem interchangeable, as the critic from GQ said to me. Well, and, and that critic went on to say something along the lines that he thought that the West Loop was basically turning into a... A food court. A food court. <laughs> yeah, I know, that was... That's a little rough. <laughs> okay, let's go to number four. You write that street food is stuck in the past. Yes. So that's another thing I'm getting, I mean, what am I not getting flack for? But um, that's another one. So I feel like it's not changing with the 21st century. There are, Chicago is a city that's known for its great street food. It's, you know, hot dogs, Italian beef, burritos. You know, it's really given birth to so much. But when was the last time you tried something that just made your toes curl. It was so delicious. I mean, I, I go back to Atlanta. Me? But oh, yeah, okay, well, go, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, I, I asked the question, I, I should, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, I, I'd, I'd say, <laughs> I, I don't know if the food makes my toes curl, but there's so many wonderful restaurants, and uh, I like I like street food. You, you talk about some of the hot dogs that you don't, you're not that crazy about, but there are options out there, people would say. I do like a, I mean, I don't mean to, I do like a good Vienna beef hot dog. I had one for lunch the other day. It's good, it's solid, but is there something that you just are like, you, you just want to go into a corner with and eat and just go, mm. <laughs> Okay, item number. I can't see you doing that. <laughs> <but>. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, but by the way, as long as we're on the subject, what is your take on uh, <laughs> on uh, deep dish and thin crust and Chicago style pizza while we're on the subject of of uh, regional foods? So I try not to stop on that landmine. I have not fallen in love with the pizza here. I do like I do like that thin you know, tavern style Midwestern pizza where it's cut into little squares. I think that can be very good. I just, I like Neapolitan pizza and I just love a good New York slice. All right, well, let's get to item number five. And, and this one is, uh, boy, you're, you're, you're really putting yourself out there and you know, I salute I know. you for that. Thanks. There's too much cheerleading locally. <laughs> uh, explain yourself, sir. Well, I think it's something that Everybody else I know who has moved to Chicago has like just been kind of surprised by how, how I mean, people love the city. People, you know, grow up here, they move her from other places in the Midwest, and they just get Chicago stars tattooed on their arms. And I feel there's like so much cheerleading. It's like Why is it's, that bad? Because if something's pretty good, you're going to say, yeah, this is fine rather than being critical. I mean, I, people in Atlanta rip things up too much. I, people are too critical there. But um, it just, to me, it feels like if we could, you know, not say everything is so great all the time, but, you know, throw a little shade now and then. I think it gets a better conversation going. You think it might be a Midwest thing where we're, where the Midwest e nice, uh, Midwest nice, Midwest positive, uh, that sort of thing. Maybe it's also like you know dealing with the cold, or you know the way you just the, the the incredible love Chicagoans have for their sports teams is beautiful to see. But it's something I just, it's wow, <laughs> it's intense. <laughs> you uh, also received some criticism for putting the onus on diners to demand yeah. better food from restaurants who distinguish pretty good between exceptional, but uh, shouldn't. Isn't that the chef's job, not the, uh, not the diners necessarily? I mean, I think it's a dialogue. I think, you know, what happens in the cult, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the culture of dining in a city, and that is a dialogue between the diners and the chefs, and I think our job as critics is to encourage that dialogue, and I'm hoping with this article that I actually did encourage that some more, even if it's going to, you know, you know, I might end up with a, you know, Malort Malatov cocktail lobbed at my house, you know, but. I don't think it'll come to that. Okay. But uh, one of the things you point out is that I think it was in 2016, Chicago had garnered a total of, uh, if you add all the Michelin stars up, there were like 26, and most recently it was down to 22. Wouldn't most cities kill to have uh, 22 stars uh, human, uh, collectively among their restaurants? Absolutely. Make, make no mistake, this is a great restaurant city. There is a lot going on. It's very exciting. This is one of the very few American cities to even merit having a Michelin Guide. And it's not like the stars tell the story. I kind of set up this, my article with that because it did parrot things I've been hearing um, from friends who were, you know, national critics and so forth, that it, things were starting to feel a little stagnant here. You know, I, I friends are constantly calling me up and asking what's new in Chicago, what's really exciting. And I want to, you know, turn them on to restaurants that are exciting, like Tokaya Antoharia, I think is great, and some others that I love. Cellar Door Provisions is a beautiful restaurant, and I just love to promote those places, but yeah. You know, sometimes, uh, whether it's uh, the restaurant scene or the theater scene or any scene, a place gets really hot and then it's kind of fashionable after a while to say, oh, well, you know, yeah. it's not what it used to be. Might there be some of that going on? Not from me. I mean, I, you know, I don't feel like I've got a dog in this fight, but I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just maybe like the, you know, the creepy person who's making the dogs fight. <laughs> I don't know. So. Finally, let's end this on a good note. Uh, <laughs> in the short time we have, uh, what do you like about Chicago's food scene? Oh, man, I mean, it is exciting. There's always, there always are things opening up. The quality of the neighborhoods here is so great. I mean, every neighborhood has its own constellation of restaurants and its own special dining culture. I'm so excited to see things continuing to open up in Logan Square. I just love exploring that. And I've got a lot of favorites here. And, you know, I do love me a good Vienna beef dog. It's <laughs> not that I don't. But John Kessler, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate your sticking your neck out. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. You're Appreciate it. And we want to hear from you. Does Chicago's food scene need work or is this city's cuisine world class? Take a poll <laughs> on our website.
And before we go, some viewer feedback. Governor-elect J.B. Pritzker wants to increase funding for education, but hasn't put out a specific plan on where the money would come from. Here's what some of you have to say about that. No matter how we look at our educational systems, it is clear that its offerings differ according to the wealth of the districts. So biased. He is welcome to privately fund it and keep his hands out of my pockets. The people who have more than one kid should pay an extra tax for each child that uses public education resources. Our tax law should stop rewarding excessive breeding. The more you use, the more you should pay. Always looking for more money to stick it to the taxpayers. How about just do a better job of educating like other states do for a lot less money? You also had strong reaction to our recent story about snagging. That is a controversial form of salmon fishing allowed in certain parts of the city where a fisherman uses a hook to try and snag a fish on any part of its body. Snagging is no more or less humane than standard fishing. Fishing is cruel and inhumane in general, and salmon snagging is appalling in particular. So I guess it's equally unfair for an Alaskan brown bear to take a swipe at a salmon in a shallow pool of water. It's just as easy pickings. Do you base your morality on that of wild animals? Bear fish is a matter of necessity. That is not the case for the vast majority of people. As it stands, I feel not a single moral quandary about catching and eating a fish with about a millionth of the neurons of the least functional human. That fish was created by humans for the sole purpose of being caught and eaten. As always, we appreciate hearing from you. You can join the discussion on Facebook and Twitter or post your comments on our website. And that is our show for this Thursday night. Stay connected by signing up for our daily briefing and join us tomorrow night at 7 for the Week in Review. Now for all of us here at Chicago tonight, I'm Phil Ponce, and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.